First, some background. Here is a capacitor. Let's say it has got capacitance C farads, and we have a voltage drop V across it. The charge on the capacitor, remember we can think of a capacitor as two metal plates, and when it's charged up, it's got electrons on one plate and an absence of electrons on the other plate, therefore forming the voltage drop. The charge on the capacitor Q is equal to C times V. In some sense, this is the definition of capacitance. To get a certain voltage drop across this capacitor, how much charge do we need to put on our plates? We also have the energy stored in the capacitor is given by a half C V squared. From these equations, we can also deduce that the energy is equal to a half Q squared on C. Here comes the paradox. Consider a capacitor over here with capacitance C. It has got a voltage of one volt across it. Its twin over here has also got capacitance C, but it's got zero volts across it. The energy on the capacitor on the left will be a half C, one squared, which is one. The energy on the right capacitor will be zero, so total energy will be a half C. Now imagine we bring these two capacitors together. We therefore have our capacitor on the left is now joined to our capacitor on the right. The combined charge is still the same, but because we now have two capacitors that have to share the same amount of charge, we have that the voltage difference is half a volt. Let's compute the energy of this system. For the capacitor on the left, I have got a half C and my voltage is now a half squared. For the capacitor on the right, my voltage is now a half C, a half squared, which means in total I have got one quarter C. What happened to my missing energy? Note that we get the same problem if we work just with charge and ignore voltage. In the diagram on the left, I can have charge Q on my left capacitor and charge zero on my right capacitor. Then when the capacitors are brought together by symmetry, I'll have half Q charge on my left capacitor and a half Q charge on my right capacitor. And if we compute the energy, then for the configuration on the left, I have got a half Q squared on C. And for the configuration on the right, I have got two times, one for each capacitor, a half, and this time I only have half as much charge on Q squared on C, and that's equal to one quarter Q squared on C. Once again, energy has been lost. Before explaining the answer, it might be worth remembering where energy comes into play. To charge up our capacitor, we have to force electrons onto this lower plate here. So I have an electron sitting out at infinity, and I have to push it, push it, push it, push it to bring it onto this plate here. It doesn't really want to be on this plate because it wants to stay away from other electrons. Yet if there are already electrons here, we really need some effort to put our electron onto this plate here. Whenever we have a physical system, we can write it in the form of differential equations, and mathematically, we can show that energy is a conserved quantity. So it's just a consequence of the equations of motion satisfied by electrons, so to speak. The reason we like to use energy is because it can simplify equations. If we know that something is conserved, we don't actually have to work out the trajectory of the dynamical system. If we want to work out some property of its final configuration based on knowledge of its initial configuration, sometimes we can use the fact that energy has been conserved to get the answer immediately without having to solve for the trajectory of the dynamical system.
In this case, though, energy seems to be causing problems for us. It, it's saying that somehow we've lost energy, even though it should be conserved. For interest's sake, let's consider the more realistic scenario of when we connect our two capacitors via some resistance R. Call the voltage on the left V1, the voltage on the right V2. Assume we've got zero volts reference at the bottom and let I be the current flowing from left to right. The equations for my capacitors give me I equals C dV2 on dt and I equals minus C dV1 on dt. The equation for the resistor gives me that V1 minus V2 equals IR. Let V be equal to V1 minus V2, which will give us the voltage drop across our resistor R here. Then from these two equations here, we get that 2I is equal to minus C dV on dt. And from our resistor equation, we get that V is equal to minus RC on 2 dV on dt. Therefore, V is equal to, so solving this equation, we know it's given by an exponential and we need an initial voltage. Let me call the initial voltage V0 e to the minus 2 on RC times time. Going back to the equations for the two capacitors, we also see that dV1 plus V2 on dt equals 0. If at time t equals 0, we have that V1 is equal to V0 and V2 equals to 0, Then we have that V1 plus V2 equals V0, and this has to be true not only at time t equals to 0, but for all time t. In summary then, we have V1 plus V2 equals V0, and V1 minus V2 equals V, giving us that V1 is going to be equal to a half V0 plus V and V2 is going to be equal to a half V0 minus V. If I attempt to draw a graph, then for our capacitor on the left, it starts at V0 and decays down to a half V0, while for our capacitor on the right, it starts at zero and rises up, charges up to a half V0. We know from our earlier calculations that we have lost energy in our capacitors, but we now know where the energy's gone. It's been dissipated as heat through this resistor R here. And according to our calculations, the amount of energy dissipated doesn't depend on the value of the resistor R. The rate at which it gets dissipated changes. If R is small, we lose a lot of energy quickly. If R is large, we lose energy slowly. But the same amount of energy must have been dis dissipated regardless of the value of R. We can actually check this mathematically. The instantaneous power dissipated in our resistor is given by the current through it times the voltage drop across it, which is equal to V squared on R. The total energy dissipated is therefore the integral of our power over time. And we know what the voltage is equal to.
we have here recovered our missing energy. In our original configuration, the energy was a half C V0 squared in the left capacitor and no energy elsewhere. At time t equals infinity, in steady state, the energy is a half C V0 on 2 squared in the left capacitor, same amount in the right capacitor, and we have lost this amount of energy through our resistor throughout the process. And if we add this up, we get exactly the same amount of energy as what we started with. And remember, this is true regardless of the value of our resistor R here, which is good and bad. The bad news is that it doesn't help us. We can't take the limit as R goes to zero and get an answer to our paradox here. This suggests that energy is dissipated through a resistor. If there is no resistor, it doesn't answer the paradox. So what happens when two capacitors come face to face with each other? Where does the missing energy go? I guess one answer is that there is a big explosion and that's where all the energy goes. But there's actually a very nice mathematical answer to this and it's important to keep it in mind to avoid making similar mistakes in other calculations you may do down the track. The moral of the story is to understand what models are describing. In our case, we have been using lumped circuit models. And for our energy calculations, we're assuming steady state. If we go back to the physics, just prior to having these capacitors brought together, we have got lots of charge on the capacitor on the left and no charge on the capacitor on the right. When we bring them together, these electrons are fighting to get away from each other. They are going to propagate down the wire to this other capacitor. But if there's no resistance, then the only thing stopping them is the speed of light. And there is our clue. The transmission from one capacitor to the other is actually going through a transmission line. Our basic circuit analysis treats wires as being ideal, but that only holds if the length of the wire is considerably longer than the wavelengths of the types of signals that are propagating down them. In our case, we are going to have a very high speed signal being sent from one capacitor to the other capacitor, and we cannot treat this as an ideal piece of wire, but rather as a transmission line, like a coaxial cable, so to speak. The first mistake we made then was to use lumped circuit models when we couldn't. We actually have to use EM models. Without explicitly doing any mathematics, we can now intuitively see what's going to happen. Just like if we have got a big bucket of water here and we suddenly release its contents down a pipe, it's going to hit the other end and slosh back. And in particular with transmission lines, we know that we get reflections. So the most likely scenario is that what happens is that the voltage between this capacitor and this capacitor is going to oscillate. So we have the full voltage here of one volt initially. That's going to travel down the transmission line till it hits this capacitor here. It's then going to bounce back and bounce forth and back and forth. And if there's no resistance in the circuit, this will keep on happening forever. And this then explains our missing energy. Our energy calculations assumed a steady state behavior, but this circuit never reaches steady state. It never converges. It keeps oscillating. So the voltage here will never be half a volt. It will never stay there. Sometimes it will be one volt. Sometimes it will be zero volts. It will keep oscillating backwards and forwards. So our second mistake we made was assuming the system had reached steady state of half a volt here and half a volt here. In fact, one possible outcome is it oscillates forever and never gets to our conjectured steady state. Very often, people forget to prove that their system has reached steady state before claiming something is true based on 
a steady state assumption. I prefer this explanation because it has a nice moral to the story when it comes to working mathematically with systems. But then there are other explanations. Probably a physicist will say if you really do push two capacitors together, then you might get a spark just before the two wires meet, for example. In other words, there will always be some kind of a resistance between the two that dissipates the excess energy. Nevertheless, it is interesting to think about this problem in a purely mathematical context and see that we were tricked into believing we had converged to a steady state behavior when in fact the system oscillated forever.